Let me read those few verses just one more time. Philemon chapter, only chapter, verse 4. I thank my God, making mention of thee always in my prayers, hearing of thy love and faith which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all saints, that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. For we have great joy and consolation in thy love, because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. Amen. The Lord bless his word. Well, we began to uh, look at the book of Philemon last week, and we noticed last week during our exploration of Paul's um, opening greetings that the letter to Philemon has a significant goal, and that goal is embracing brotherly love and forgiveness. Although Philemon wasn't lacking or isn't lacking in these things, and um, he, he wasn't lacking in these areas, but Paul was about to emphasize in this letter his desire for Philemon to receive Onesimus back as a beloved uh, brother. And that receiving of Onesimus back would be in the context, of course, of this brotherly love and forgiveness. Uh, today's verses, then, Paul underlines the qualities that he admires about Onesimus. He, or about uh, Philemon, sorry. Uh, he expresses gratitude, but not to Philemon. He expresses gratitude to God for Philemon, noting that he's constantly hearing of Philemon's love and faith towards the Lord Jesus and his affections uh, for his brothers. And so as we look into these verses tonight, we discover the power of mutual uh, affection. And that's the, that's the essence of our topic tonight. It's the power of brotherly love. Because brotherly love has a power inherent in it. And it's marvelous. We were thinking a little bit about that this morning. I was saying to Anne earlier on today that it's amazing that I've been mulling over Philemon for a few months uh, as the next Sunday evening and it just is amazing to me that when we start to look at the book of Philemon which is about brotherly love Peter uh, our morning sessions has reached that place in his letter speaking of the same thing and it's really nothing to do with me. It wasn't planned. It's just the way God has, well, it was planned by God. It wasn't planned by me. And I always find these things really interesting because it's almost like God is underlining what he's teaching. Not only will you hear it in the morning, but you'll, you'll hear it at night as well, he's saying. So here we are, uh, this topic of brotherly love and of course the reason God wants to speak about brotherly love is the same reason that he got Paul to write this letter to Philemon it's powerful it's a powerful way to live so Paul's teaching in this little passage lays the groundwork for the sensitive matter that he's going to bring up a little bit later as he appeals to Philemon to embrace his runaway slave Onesimus as a beloved brother. So let's look at these verses then. Verse 4, the first thing we notice as I, I hinted at in the, uh, introducing it, the first thing we notice is that Paul gives thanks for this brother Philemon. 
He gives thanks for Philemon's love of and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and also for his love for all the saints in verse 4. And it's beautiful that Paul doesn't write to Philemon and say, Philemon, I'm so grateful to you for your love and faith in Christ. I'm so grateful to you for the way in which you love your brothers. Paul thanks God for this. And that's something that we marvel at and rejoice at as a church. That God receives all the glory, God receives all the credit, God receives all the thanks for everything. And here he is being thanked by Paul for this man at Philemon. And this is what Paul does, of course, in several places. In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 15, he says the same thing. He says, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. And he does the same thing in Colossians as well, chapter 1 and verses 3 and 4 and elsewhere. And what that does is that it emphasizes something that we know here in this church but it's something that can bear repeating time and time again. What Paul does here in verse 4 of Philemon is emphasize that Philemon's love and faith in Christ are of divine origin. These are not attributes that he has generated himself. These are virtues that have been given to Philemon as a gift from Almighty God. We cannot love Jesus unless God gives us the gift of loving Jesus. We, ha we cannot have faith in Jesus unless God gives us that gift of faith. And we know that here. We, we love that truth here. For, gra for by grace are ye saved through faith. And this not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. Even in First Timothy chapter 1, verse 14, Paul says, And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. In other versions, he talks about this uh, grace being poured out on him, together with love and faith. So Paul's well aware, and we are now well aware, that these are gifts of God. And the virtues that we see in Philemon are rooted in the transformational work of Christ in his life. And so when we look into a world that doesn't know Jesus, we mustn't expect them to love him. We mustn't expect this city, this nation, to express love for Christ. And if we don't expect it, then boy, we're certainly not disappointed. There isn't a love for Jesus in our land. So we pray, don't we, that the Holy Spirit would move in the hearts of people that the Spirit of God would move in the church and send the church with a powerful message. When I say that, we know the gospel is powerful, but with a powerful anointing to take that message so that people's hearts will be moved and they will be able because they're being enabled by the Holy Spirit to love Christ and to have faith in him. In a sense, the reality is that it's through Christ's love demonstrated on the cross, through his faithfulness to reconcile us to God, that Philemon is empowered to love him back. 
It's simply another way of saying we love him because he first loved us. I thank my God, making mention of thee always in my prayers, hearing of thy love and faith towards the Lord Jesus. And that's beautiful when we think that Philemon is an example of us and we see in Philemon this ability that Christ gives us to love him. And we're here tonight and, and, and we, we thank God that we are able to praise him. Not one of us gets the credit for praising him. I, I, love, I love that. And it doesn't matter how high our praise is. It doesn't matter how transported we are. We don't get the credit for worshipping Jesus. He gets the credit because he has warmed our hearts. He's molded our hearts. In fact, he may even have had to break our hearts in order to drop into those hearts a desire to praise his name. There is an old rabbinic saying that says the word of God is dropped onto the surface of the human heart. And sometimes that human heart needs to be broken so that the word of God will drop in. It's the, it, it's, it's the truth. God puts it on us and he may break our hearts in order to bring us to that place where we look up to Jesus Christ and we give him all the glory because we know at that moment there is nothing in us. He says, I thank my God for who you are, Philemon. He has made you who you are. But Philemon doesn't simply have a love for Jesus and a faith in Christ. He doesn't, that's not simply it for Philemon. Philemon is expressing the reality of that love and that faith. You see, it's fabulous when we get together and we praise Christ and, and, and we have this sense of, wow, that was awesome. Jesus helped us there. We've all been in meetings, surely, and we have all been in meetings where the, the Holy Spirit has just taken us and it's been beautiful. When we, we don't want to go home because we're too busy praising God. There are times when the Lord doesn't let you go until he's finished with you. Times when we can only sit and worship. Times when silence comes upon the meeting and before you know it, that silence is filled with the presence of Almighty God. And what happens then is that we all begin to praise God all over again. We've all been in meetings like that. It's marvelous, but Philemon had this love and faith in Jesus. But he expressed it. He expressed it outwardly to his brothers and sisters. Jesus wants us to be like that. That the, the love that we demonstrate to him the, 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 the awe that we feel in his presence, the adoration that just rises up from us. Christ wants to turn that back, bless us with beautiful blessing that we then take out to one another and we express with one another. That's what Philemon was doing. In Galatians uh, chapter 5, verse 6. He 
He says, For in Christ neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. It's all very well for us to sit and praise God. But it's the, it's the, it's the expression of that faith in a horizontal direction that is so powerful. There's power in brotherly love. Power. Philemon's faith, you see, wasn't a dead faith. It was a living faith. It wasn't a faith that, that had uh, been contained into Philemon's own personal little experience of Jesus and his own private experience of Jesus. It may even be a, a massive experience of Jesus, but Philemon didn't keep it all in. It wasn't fenced off as his experience, as his life. No, folks, what is that? What is that? You see, Philemon's faith wasn't dead. It was a, a living and active faith. And he was showing his love for Christ through acts of love for his brothers. James says, I will show thee my faith by my works. And of course, because we're in a Protestant tradition, we are in the Protestant way of things, and we can look at that verse properly. I make no apology for saying that. Because others look at that verse and, and they say, well, there you are, there is uh, the good works that bring you to salvation. But you see, we know that, don't we? We know that James chapter 2 and these verses round about verse 18 and 19, and we know that the good works that James is talking about, the good works that Philemon is demonstrating, is the fruit of his salvation. It's not the pathway to salvation. It's the fruit of of his salvation. We thank God for that. And so Philemon is expressing the fact that he has a genuine love for Jesus, a genuine faith for Jesus, in Jesus, because you see his life is marked with acts of love to brothers and sisters. Oh, how powerful is brotherly love when we are expressing the love of Christ to one another. When we love the Lord like Philemon loved the Lord. When we have faith like he had faith. That gives birth to a heart within us that desires the benefit and the well-being of brothers and sisters. Do we get that perfectly right? Absolutely not. We fail. Doesn't he change the teaching of Scripture, though? He loved Christ, therefore he had to love those around him. Christ's sacrificial love inspires or motivates Philemon. Christ's love for him, the sacrifice Christ made for him, means that Philemon has to, has to live life reflecting that with those around him. In other words, if Philemon is loving his brothers and sisters, then it's because Christ is enabling him to do that. I had a discussion this morning after the, the, the morning service and 
we were saying that brotherly love is not something that we can do ourselves. It's not. Brotherly love is something that Christ enables in and through us. So, we don't get the credit for praising Almighty God. We don't get the credit for worshipping Jesus. He gets the credit. We don't get the credit even for brotherly love. He gets the credit. It's him that's doing it. And if it's not happening, if it's not happening, what are we saying about the Lord Jesus? Do we agree with one another in every detail all of the time? Oh, away you go. Do you think scripture would be writing about that? We're going to disagree at times. But we're never going to stop loving. We're never going to stop wanting the best. We're never going to stop embracing one another. We're never going to stop receiving one another and forgiving one another. We need to forgive one another. We need to say to one another, it's okay. You've messed up. Well, I've messed up more. I love you. I forgive you. We move on. Because the devil cannot handle that. The devil cannot handle a fellowship that loves one another out of its love for Jesus Christ. What it will mean is that he'll attack us all the more. <laughs> but we need to be strong. We need to be wise. We need to be able to say, Because I love him, I love you. And I forgive you. That's what we need to say. Christ himself enables that love because you see that is way beyond each one of us. So we must surrender to him. As I said this morning, we must make sure that we are walking with Christ so that Christ's life is filling us. So that the life of the vine fills the branches and flows through the branches and produces the fruit which the branches bear. That's how we need to be. Because we're told in Philippians 2 verse 13 that God is the one who makes us willing and makes us able. He says, Paul says there, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So God's good pleasure is that we love one another with brotherly love, forgiving one another, and we're told that those very virtues that God wants to see in us, which please him, he makes us willing and able. But we need to be close. We need to be close to the Savior. But it's always the order of things. It's never a different order. The order is always Jesus first and then to everyone else. If we don't love Jesus, we will not love the people who belong to Jesus. If we have a, an estranged relationship with Jesus Christ, then we will have an estranged relationship with brothers and sisters. The deeper our relationship is with Jesus, the more he is filling us, the more we are giving up of ourselves in order for him to be glorified in us, then the deeper, fuller, more, most comprehensive love for our brothers and sisters is then expressed. Isn't it brilliant? 
My responsibility is to be close to him and let him love me, love you through me. That's your responsibility. The word of God is really quite strong on the fact that it's required of us. Love and faith towards Christ and then love for brothers and sisters. In 1 John chapter 4. Verse 20. If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he's a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. Because there's power in brotherly love. So Paul is showing his gratitude for this man Philemon. But in verse 6, we see the power of brotherly love from a different angle, if you like. Paul says that he's praying that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. What Paul is saying there and some versions bring this out, some translations bring this out. What he's saying there is, as Philemon shares his faith, as Philemon continues to work out the love that he has for Jesus and, and to work that love out into the, the lives of brothers and sisters, the more Philemon does that, sharing his faith, the more Philemon understands the blessings and the riches that he has in Christ Jesus. That's what Paul is saying, that the communication of your faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. Sharing the faith brings us into a, a greater awareness of what we have in Christ ourselves. And when we grow in the awareness of what we have in Christ ourselves, we become even more effective in sharing that faith. How do you get to that place of a greater knowledge of my sal of your salvation how do i get there with, with to a greater knowledge of my salvation evangelize tell people about the greatness of jesus christ speak to brothers and sisters evangelize the church in that sense and speak to brothers and sisters and tell them what you have in jesus And you will begin to realize, actually, what I have in Jesus is immense. Do you see that? I'm telling someone else about salvation, about the cross, about the wonder of the blood, about the blessings of knowing Jesus Christ. I'm telling someone else, and in the telling of that person, the Holy Spirit is driving that deeper and deeper and deeper into me. Hallelujah. Oh, Paul says, I want your, the communication of your faith to be effective, Philemon. I want you to grow in, the understanding of what you have and share that 
and continue to grow and share that and continue to grow. You're doing it, Philemon. You're spreading the faith to your brothers and sisters. You're doing it. I want you to be effective more so in doing this. And you will grow. And the more we grow, brothers and sisters, the more we grow in our understanding of Jesus, then the greater our communication of that to others will be. And it's a circle that just goes round and round. This is the deepening understanding of the power of brotherly love. Isn't that amazing? That Philemon will understand more. These blessings are immense. Articulate the blood. Articulate your justification. And just feel the Holy Spirit boom, 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 boom. Hitting at home. Yeah, you're right. Isn't it brilliant? Let me tell you about Jesus. Yeah, you're right. Isn't it marvelous? This is what you have. This is what you have. Keep sharing it. I think it's a, a real... It's a, an unseen extra blessing, if you like, that those who share their faith, even within the fellowship, are blessed by God with a deeper awareness of Jesus Christ in their own lives. And if we don't ever share Jesus Christ amongst ourselves, if we don't talk about Jesus, then well, what a sadness because you're depriving yourself of a, of a deepening understanding of the salvation blessings that you have. One of, the, one of the things that used to hurt me was if I was in, uh, speaking with, with those who were Christian and the conversation never, ever had Jesus Christ in it. Unless I brought Jesus into the conversation, it's not there. That's a sadness. Because if we don't talk about Jesus Christ, then we're denying ourselves as much as our brothers and sisters. So here was Philemon expressing his faith in all sorts of practical ways. And Paul is appealing, and he will appeal to Onesimus, uh, to Philemon a little later, to receive Onesimus, his brother, back in. This runaway slave. Philemon, if you receive him back, you will grow. Brotherly love is so powerful because not only does it touch the person that you're loving, you grow by it. And the church, by extension, grows by your brotherly love. Onesimus comes back to be reconciled to Philemon. I've said before, and I may even have said it last time, this church regularly prays on a Wednesday night. We are regularly praying for those that were amongst us, but are no longer amongst us, praying for them to return to us. And that's fabulous. 
Because this church has been given an opportunity by God not only to pray them back, to pray them in. And what I mean by that is not only to pray them back, but to pray them, pray so that the roots go down and they're here. And how do we facilitate, at least in part, that people will come back to the church and stay, and not only stay, but then get involved. How do we do that, brotherly love? Brotherly love and forgiveness. How beautiful is it? You see the power, the power of brotherly love. It has an effect on those who are expressing it as well as to those who are being loved. And it has an effect on the whole church. Did I say that that's what I felt since the minute I've walked through this door? I think I said that last week as well. I felt loved. You're going to have to forgive me at some point. Because there's brotherly love and forgiveness. Oh, that we would just continue to be like that. That this fellowship would continue to be a fellowship where people feel loved when they come in the door. Where people feel wanted when they come in the door. When we see brothers and sisters returning, when we see the prodigals coming back, <gasps> yes! All the stuff that caused people to leave, all the stuff that's caused estrangement in our own lives. Oh, the power. Of loving one another that way. That doesn't mean that we will always be in each other's pockets then. But you know, in a church, there is absolutely no room whatsoever for grudges. Grudges will kill the fellowship. Because fellowship isn't about the numbers. is isn't about the, that we gather. Fellowship is that we're intertwined. And so grudges don't have a part to play. Brotherly love and forgiveness. Oh, hallelujah for brotherly love and forgiveness has power to set us free, has power to enable not only individuals, but this church to soar. There is power to soar to heights that we've not been to for a while. How great would it be for Zion Baptist Church just to rise up and soar on the wings of eagles because we love each other. And because my offense to your heart has been just, oh, fine, we move on. Oh, it's dead easy to talk like that, Pastor, when you've not been hurt, I can't have been hurt. And I'll tell you something else, I've hurt people. Thank God, I, I've, I've mentioned before the old saints that I went to when I just get saved, how gracious they were. And the amount of nonsense I used to spout. Don't dare sit there thinking, are you still spouting it? The amount of rubbish that I used to say to people, because I thought I knew. Hmm. They didn't kick me out. 
They only kicked me out when I started to hold to the doctrines of grace. But for all the years up until then, hallelujah, they forgave me. They're still forgiving me. They're still loving me. Those people that I hurt, those people that I... <sighs> anyway. They're still loving us. Praise God. Because you see, brotherly love is powerful. And, and one of the things that we need to guard against as a church, and we need to guard against this root that can spring up. And that root of bitterness or they did this to me I did that to them and how can we carry on together because oh folks see if you're in this church building tonight see if you're in this church on a Lord's Day a Wednesday Friday see if you're if you're here then the Lord is saying to you and to me forget it and move on the past is the past. The future is the future. Oh, hallelujah. As we love one another, as we forgive one another, the blessing is coming, as I was saying this morning. Amen. Praise God. But then you see that there is a, a ripple effect to brotherly love. In verse 7, Paul says, For we have great joy and consolation in thy love. Paul and Timothy, who is with him, and others in Paul's circle, they are being encouraged, impacted by what they see in Philemon. You see, the brotherly love that we have to one another, that we express to the person sitting next to us, when other people in the congregation and other people in the church see that, they're encouraged. It lifts them up. Brotherly love lifts up the whole congregation. It lifts up the whole fellowship. There is a ripple effect to loving and forgiving each other. Paul was personally feeling this joy and comfort when he heard about this man Philemon and how Philemon's love and faith was being expressed in actions towards those who also knew and loved the Lord Jesus. It was having a, a positive effect on the apostle. those who were being buoyed up, those who were having their bowels refreshed. Verse 7. Weren't simply those who were receiving Philemon's love upon themselves, but it was also everyone else who saw it happening. Everyone else was encouraged as this brother loved the saints. But the opposite is true as well. I want to tell you right now how easily discouraged we can be when we don't see that. Paul was encouraged because Philemon was who Philemon was and, and it was bringing to the heart of the apostle this great joy. It was refreshing all the saints who were receiving and who were round about witnessing Philemon's love. In Romans chapter 12, verse 5. So we, being many, are one body in Christ and every one members of another. And if that is true, then when 
one is expressing love to the other, the whole body is lifted up. This is brilliant. This is absolutely brilliant. Because as, as needs to be emphasized again, God is not saying to us tonight, see you lot. You lot, what a waste of space. You see what God is doing tonight and at this time with all these messages on brotherly love and, and forgiveness, what God is doing is actually saying to us, do you know something? Here is how much I love Zion Baptist Church. Here is how much I love you as an individual Christian. This much, that if you love your brothers and forgive them for what they've done or no done, if they do the same to you, here's the thing. Blessing. Don't you want power to be released in this place? Amen. What happens in revival is that the power of God comes upon a, a church that's struggling. People that are, that are under the weather spiritually. And that, that's br brilliant. The, the spirit of God blows through and the church is in fire. The church is moving. Christians are doing what they need to do. But revival stops. Have you noticed that? And often revival stops because brothers and sisters have stopped loving one another the way they should. And oof. But what a joy God says to us today. The power of brotherly love is awesome. Of course, this refreshing of the, the hearts of the saints or the lovely phrase that the authorized version uses, the bowels of the saints being refreshed. We don't get the credit for coming to Christ. We don't get the credit for worshiping Christ. We don't get the credit for loving one another. And we don't get the credit for refreshing one another. Because you see, Philemon's life was refreshing the saints, but the reality is it was Christ in him who was refreshing the saints. Do you see what it all boils down to? The power of brotherly love is the, the power of Christ in us. He is the one who does the refreshing. That's why in Acts chapter 3 and verse 20, we're told that refreshing comes from the presence of the Lord. That's where refreshing is. And so what we're being asked to do by this scripture, what, what Paul is saying to Philemon is be Christ. Be a reflection of Christ in your circle. More and more and more. And watch the impact grow and grow and grow. We have great joy and con consolation in thy love because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. The bowels of the saints are refreshed by Philemon because Christ is at work in this man. So what have we been taught there also? We must not be satisfied with how things are in ourselves. We should be people who long to experience Christ at work in us. Because when Christ is at work in us, we become more like Christ to others. And they are impacted by a, a love that we can't describe. How much do you love one another? As much as Christ loves each other through us. Oh, Paul gave thanks for this man, Philemon. And really he was giving thanks to God for Christ in him. The power 
of brotherly love and this ripple effect that it has as it flows through a fellowship. So what do you want to be, as I bring this to an end, what do you want to be? Do you want to be the catalyst of this ripple effect of love and forgiveness? Or do you, are you quite happy to be the dam that's holding it up? I'm just saying that that is a challenge, isn't it? We can be catalysts or we can get in the way. Zion, we have a wonderful future. I believe that with all of my heart, that this fellowship, those who are here right now, I thoroughly believe that we will be joined. We will grow. We will go forward into a blessing. If you don't believe that, then you need to get before the Lord. Because we are going forward, and part of going forward into this overflowing blessing is brotherly love and forgiveness whenever it is required. Not when, well, when they get themselves sorted. When they come and apologize. Nah. Just because you love Jesus. And Jesus loves them. Jesus loves all of us individually and together. Isn't that the reason for brotherly love and forgiveness? Oh, there's power in this. There's power in brotherly love. Heavenly Father, how we praise you tonight. We thank you when your word comes to our hearts, even if it comes powerfully to our hearts, oh God. Even when it, it stings us a little. Father, how grateful we are that this is a mark of your love for this fellowship. That even before, perhaps before we we experience these things you're preparing us oh god for the future maybe there are issues that need to be dealt with just now but you are preparing us for the future we don't want to miss out on anything that you have for this church father we want to be the fullness of what you have designed us to be so that we can glorify your great and holy name Oh, Father God, thank you for tonight. Thank you for today. Thank you for Philemon. Thank you for Peter. Thank you for the Apostle Paul. Thank you for faithful men and women that have occupied this church down through the years. Thank you for a faithful pastor who taught this fellowship the realities of Jesus Christ. who loved this fellowship. Oh, Father God, may that excitement just well up within us now as we go forward. All for the glory of your name. Through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.